Hello, my name is Marcia Cripps, and I'm going to be doing my presentation for seaweed as a fertilizer for forages. These are the, excuse me, these are the topics that are going to be covered in this presentation. I'm going to go in on the background of seaweed used in agriculture, the agricultural uses specifically with forages and animals, the types of seaweed products that can that are that are out there and then the manufacturing process that goes with it and then products that the grower or the cattleman or you can buy today that goes to the end consumer the research or the previous proof behind all this stuff and then the benefits of using seaweed fertilizer potential drawbacks and the cost effectiveness of using this product and then I wanted to answer the question, which is the reason why I did this research topic, which is should seaweed be used in forages today? So a little bit of background for agricultural use of seaweed. Seaweed is found all over the world and that's anywhere from like up north in like Nova Scotia, Canada, to the coast of South Africa and Australia. And it's marketed as either a plant stress reliever for the crop world or to improve animal immune systems for animal agriculture. The first recorded use of seaweed in ag is dated back to as early as the 14th century. And before I get going, I do wanna share my personal story and my background for why I picked this topic. So I used to be a PCA. That's how I got my career started in agriculture. That stands for Pest Control Advisor. Pretty much in California, you can't advise or write chemical recs without a PCA license. And that's what I did. And I work with growers there, mostly in almonds. Now I live in Michigan and I work with potatoes and I'm an agronomist and work for a potato farm. And in both of these situations, I've had to deal with water stress. In California, it was a little bit of drought stress and of course, salt issues too. And in Michigan, I'm dealing with long, gr longer growing seasons because potatoes in comparison to the rest of the world, we have a longer growing season. It's usually done in 90 days out West and we have to make it work twice as long. And I found a 17% yield increase by using seaweed fertilizer products. And I've also just visibly seen a bigger root mass in comparison to like rows or places where I don't use seaweed fertilizer. So when I was taking this class and was told that I needed to pick a topic, I thought, hmm, I wonder if this could translate in forages and also what it would do to the animals because I don't have an animal ag background. So it was a little bit of curiosity. So I wondered if this could work. So in forages, the reason why seaweed fertilizer is used is to improve the root mass and the root growth. And then it's also used as a PGR, <coughs> a plant growth regulator and used to help with water stress like I, mentioned salt stress areas and then night temperature stress relief. And then in my situation right now, a longer growing season because you grow for a longer season, you just expose yourself to more risk of disease and just a bunch of bad stuff that could potentially happen. So application options, if uh, you're going to be using this product for a crop situation, you can aerial spray it you can ground spray, you can also do chemigation and dry spray to blend. Obviously, this all depends on the setup that you have. And if we're talking forages, I think the most likely situation or option you're going to have is through ground spray and aerial spray. I've mostly done chemigation with this product, but that's just because how I was set up in California. I had double line drip. Here in Michigan, I can do a little bit of chemigation through the pivot, but um, I think the only option I have is ground spray or aerial spray. In animal agriculture, the reasons why uh, it's cited to use fertile, uh, seaweed products either as a fertilizer or just directly feeding it to them. So those are the two options. They either 
um, as an application method will broadcast spread where the animals are going to be grazing and then they have the animals graze over it and then that's how they get the seaweed benefit or they feed it directly right into their food. And the reason for doing this is that it's shown to improve gut health, improve immunity systems, and in their case, heat stress too. So um, I've heard like in Texas where it gets super hot, they'll put seaweed into their diet or they'll spread it um, as a fertilizer onto the forages and then have them eat it. And this is something that I found interesting um, while doing this project. I had no idea about it, which was that this also leads to being in methane an environmentally friendly choice. So here's the article on it. Um, and pretty much uh, in this research, it showed that there was an 82% reduction in methane emissions when they pretty much fed cows seaweed. They fed them about 1.5 to three ounces. So I do want to clarify in this situation, they were directly feeding it into their feed. They weren't broadcasting it like over where they were grazing. And I thought it was interesting that this did not negatively affect their ability to put on weight and also showed a reduction in methane emissions. And I think it's super interesting just because, well, anything with the environment or methane and animal ag, especially cows is such a hot button topic. I mean, we just literally went through that whole uh, Burger King commercial fiasco. So I thought this was pretty cool. Now I'm gonna go into the types of seaweed products that are out there. And when I mean types of seaweed products, this isn't the kind that you can buy for the end consumer. This is just uh, the categories that they could come in. I do wanna clarify before I continue that um, on seaweed and kelp, um, they're used interchangeably. Um, I hear it all the time, but wanna clarify that seaweed is the broad term and pretty much that's, <coughs> excuse me, any and all marine life or kelp. That's a subgroup. So think of seaweed as the umbrella and then underneath it is kelp. That's the subgroup of seaweed. And this is the largest form of seaweed and what, well, this is where the products for the fertilizer and all this animal stuff comes from. It comes from the kelp. So just wanted to clarify, but these terms can be used interchangeably and I hear it all the time. So uh, there's a difference. You can have fresh water. This is less common. Um, there's less salt content in it, so I guess that's like the main marketing point is that it's got less salt content, but it's not cost effective, and the only reason I've heard about this is just because I live in the Great Lakes um, now, but I don't really know of anybody using it. I've never tried it, but it's something that is coming up now, so I'm interested to see if this changes or does anything in the next few years, but only time will tell. Now, what I'm going to be talking about pretty much the rest of this time, well, the rest of this presentation is salt water. And this is more common and the only form that I knew of until I started this research and project. And this can be used um, pretty much anywhere. Um, there is a disclaimer. I've been told that it can be an issue in sodium dominant places, but I haven't seen that happen. And um, being in California, I've been to places where the EC is electrical conductivity would be super low. And the sodium, like if you looked at it, like on a soil test was the biggest <laughs> number that was on the thing. And um, I've been able to use seaweed fertilizer products and foliar products and haven't seen it be an issue, but that's just my experience but that's something that I've been told. This is obviously cheaper than the freshwater sources. And then it's uh, grown in more hostile environments. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about hostile environments later, but uh, yeah, those are the differences when it comes to fresh and salt water. Liquid versus granular. So in liquid, you get a lot of the bulk organic matter removed. That's just something that happens with liquids. Um, you get more application options. And I think that's why I like working with liquids way more than I do granulars. Um, I just haven't had good luck with granulars, but I like it because mainly with liquids, because you can go and blend that with your crop protection. Like I will take seaweed fertilizer and blend it with gramoxone. And that way it saves me a pass because uh, paying the applicator to go out 
that's expensive. And it's also more consistent when you have it in liquid form, just in general versus a granular form, because uh, when you have it, something in granular form, each granular like piece is different. They're not exactly 100% identical, but uh, doing it in granular, it benefits the soil more. It's cost effective. You've got a way better shelf life. So you can keep it in storage for way longer than you do with liquids. And then um, I have found out you can use the granular seaweed with a liquid if you put it in first into the tank. That is the key here. You need to put the dry product in first. And then you could put the liquid in, but uh, learn from my mistakes. Watch the pH of the other products. Uh, you don't want to be mixing this stuff with anything acidic, or if you were like me, do not mix this product or products with calcium, it's not gonna end well for you. All right, so now I'm gonna go into, so there's two main big categories when it comes to seaweed products that are out there. There's, I guess the best way to put it, modes of action. So there's two types of modes of actions and you're either gonna, when you get a seaweed product, you're either gonna be getting a cytokine seaweed product based on the type that it is or an auxin or number three which i don't have it listed here a blend of cytokine and auxin so technically three different kinds i'm going to start with the most common kind cytokine so that's responsible for cell division so think roots and shoots the growth and this is the industry standard i've seen that this is the industry standard not just with crops and forages, but also an animal ag. This is um, the one. And an example company that pretty much like champions cytokine products and produces the most of it is Acadian. Now, the other kind is auxin. So this is responsible for stem elongation. So think stems, buds, roots, tips, like th those type of things and also maintains apical dominance. Um, it's used more as a foliar, as I've seen it. And an example of a company that produces a lot of it is Afri Kelp. And they also advertise it to not just be a foliar, but they say that you can get the same benefits as the cytokine dominant ones, but we'll get into that a little bit later. And then the third kind is just blending the two together. So I want to be clear, this is uh, the best way to think of it, the modes of actions or the options of modes of actions when it comes to buying seaweed products. Um, I mentioned it earlier about hardiness. And uh, so there's also warm seaweed climate sources and then cold seaweed climate sources. Uh, I'm going to start with the warm. So that's like, think of the coast of South Africa and Australia. These are oxen dominant. Uh, Eclonia maxima is the name. So like if you're looking on a label, that is what you would see for what is in it. And then I want to drive this point home because this is so important that different climates mean different sources, which pretty much means a different mode of action. So depending on where you're at in the world and where the seaweed came from, it's either going to be a little more cytokine dominant or auxin dominant. And then in the cold, it, so think Nova Scotia, Canada, Ireland, these are the hardier products. And we, and this is the one that's most common and you'll hear it a lot. It's Ascophyllum nodosum. And the reason why they're hardier is because they had the rock seaweed process and I'm going to go over that. So rock seaweed, um, as it says in the name, it's seaweed that sits on rocks. And then when the tide goes out, so right here, we have the tide going out, the seaweed sits on the rock and it gets exposed to the sun. And Nova Scotia, even though that's a cold place, it still gets warm, especially in the summertime. So it'll get exposed from the summer to winter temperatures. And then when the tide comes back in, it'll take the seaweed and pull it back into the very cold sea. And it's said that because it can live through both the extremes of a warm environment during the day 
and then get pulled back into the dark, cold environment of the unforgiving sea, that's what makes it hardier and why it's going to be better for whatever you're using it for. So that's the reasoning. I'm going to go over the manufacturing processes. So um, when you buy your seaweed products, it's always very important to ask your sales rep or whoever you're working with, what is your manufacturing process? Because that's going to make a whole world of difference. So one option is the press method, where pretty much the seaweed gets ground down and it gets pressed down and pulverized um, like a juice press. Um, this is a less effective product by doing that, but it's a cheaper result. So something to always ask. The other kind is extraction. So this is where it goes to a chemical extraction process where pretty much the cell wall contents are taken out and then whatever's left over gets uh, grounded and sent to cattle feed actually is what I learned. And then this is a more effective product, but you're gonna be paying the price. So something to think about, but this is a good question to ask. And that way it's a good indicator to know if uh, the price you're getting is fair or not. So um, that's why it's important to ask your sales rep. All right, so ascophyllum and dosum seaweed. This uh, mode of action is cytokine-like and it affects, um, has cytokine-like effects, so it promotes the root growth. This is the one that's the most researched, most used, used for forages, crops, and animals. Eclonium maxima. This uh, pretty much is oxen-dominant response that affects stems, roots, and the tips. There's some research done on this and it's starting to, I'm starting to see usage of this picked up. It's mainly used as a PGR and not so much for stress relief, but um, I've been hearing claims that it does exactly the same, but there's not a lot of research. So I got to take that information and I highly suggest everybody else to take that information with a grain of salt. And then there's this kind, the Macrocytis uh, pyrifera, that is the warm climate and Dura Vala Antarctica, the cold climate seaweed. And this is a blend. So a blend of the cytokine and oxen. And the cytokine is the, and the cold and the oxen is the warm. And in this situation, you're getting the best of both worlds and you need to watch your ratios. So uh, when you are looking at a product label, you need to beware of the ratio of each kind. So when you get a product, you need to know, is it 50-50 or is it more cytokine dominant versus oxen or vice versa? And different ratios are gonna work for different scenarios. So uh, do your <coughs> homework on it, work with an agronomist, um, work with somebody that is knowledgeable about this before just going ahead and buying one. This is very new to the seaweed scene and there's hardly any research done on blending pretty much the two modes of actions other than the trials that I'm seeing in Arizona and California. They look very promising, um, but then again, that's in tree crops. So got to take that information with a grain of salt, especially if you're in a different situation such as forages. All right, now I'm gonna go over products. These are the products that the end consumer, like Joe Grower, you, me, can buy that are on the market. All right, I'm gonna start off with Acadian. This is the cytokine dominant Ascophyllum nodosum. That is what is in their stuff. Um, they are organic, they're OMRI certified. And this is, once again, the cold seaweed, the hardy stuff. And they use the extraction method. So, it's going to be a little more expensive because they're chemically taking the seaweed out. They offer their products in a dry and a liquid form. It's a little bit expensive, but this is once again the industry standard. And if you say like Acadian, like in the Central Valley of California, people will register it and they'll know what it means. Um, it's got brand recognition, like how like we think glyphosate, we think Roundup. And then it's two to six pints an acre is the recommended rate for their stuff. Now this switching gears is for animal consumption. So it's called Tasco. This is the same 
uh, mode of action, the Ascophyllum nodosum, the cold stuff. And this is the most research that has been done when it comes to animal agriculture benefits. So if you like search like Google Scholar, you'll see Tosco come up a bunch and it's advertised as a prebiotic and it comes in a dry. Um, they also chemically extract their product and um, their seaweed source actually comes from, uh, um, from Canada. And this also is the industry standard in the animal ag industry. And their recommendation is to give the cattle 0.5 ounces uh, per head per day. Now, this is Africa. This is oxen dominant. So unlike the last two that I just talked about, this is oxen dominant. This has the Eclonia maxima. And this also is organic Omri certified. It's a warm seaweed. It's for crop use only. It's not registered for animal use. And um, yet um, it looks like uh, they haven't, they've talked about it, but it looks like um, they haven't registered it from what I'm gathering. It's mostly liquid options. I know they have a dry, but they never seem to have it available. And this product is pressed. So it's a little bit cheaper and pretty much uh, they go around and advertise themselves as the cost effective rival to the standards products. And their recommendation is two to four pints an acre for effectiveness with their product. Now this is Fertum, that's the name of the company. And this has the Macrocystis pipheria and the Dervella Antarctica. This is the blend. So this is the Chilean company. And it's the first that I know of that has blended a static and dominant and an oxen dominant, dominant product into one. Um, I'm unsure of the manufacturing process, so I'm not gonna assume and guess and be wrong. And pretty much uh, they use different ratios of both to make their products. Um, most products are blended with other nutrients. So like you'll see on the label, they'll say um, the type of seaweed, but they're also with the ratio, but they're also gonna say that it's blended with phosphate as well. And I think it's super interesting and cool that they have come up with a way to blend the warm and cold seaweed and put it in a product and advertise it to be used together. It's middle of the road when it comes to price. Um, they offer dry and liquid options. This is very new, but it has a lot of buzz around it. I can't stop hearing about it from every other CCA and professional um, in my field, especially out in California. And then they recommend 2.5 to four pints an acre to make their product work. Now I'm gonna go over the past evidence or the research. So back to Tasco, um, I said earlier that if you just like search, you'll see Tasco a lot on Google Scholar and past research. And in this situation, what they did was they had these beef steers grazing on endophyte infected tall fescue with seaweed extract. And then they also had the same beef steers um, grazing right next to it on tall fescue that was also endophyte infested, but did not have the seaweed extract. So the beef steers that were grazing on this endophyte infected tall fescue, but also were eating seaweed extract showed to be less stressed. And it also showed that the steers had way better coats in comparison than the ones that didn't have the seaweed extract. And then, yeah, pretty much um, this research proved that you can have the endophyte infected tall fescue and still be able to feed the steers on it without having the negative results if you added a little bit of seaweed extract. So I thought that was cool. Now this is with grapes in California. And the situation here is that they were facing multiple stresses, drought stress, salt stress, and then water stress. And um, this situation, they tested nano size. So they pretty much like ground down the particle size of fertilizer and they put that against seaweed. And I do want to make a point here that all this research that I'm talking about is on the Ascophyllum nodosum only. That's the cold hardy one. And yeah, so, and then they also took it a step further and they compared blending the nano-sized particles and the seaweed together 
on these grapes in these uh, stressed out conditions. And they found out through their research, the fertilizer and the seaweed blend did the best. And it proved that using seaweed and nano fertilizers can relieve stress and also lead to a yield bump due to the stress reduction. So I think that's pretty amazing that um, that can happen, especially in such a salt and drought stress condition. So in this research, this is back to Tasco again in animal agriculture, they tested selenium and shelf life. So these steers were fed this, the Tasco product and um, they had Tasco treated fescue in this situation. And so, yeah, they, they tested that they had higher selenium when they fed these steers Tasco while they ate on um, fescue and whole blood, regardless if the endophyte was present. So kind of like the first research project that I talked about on um, Tasco, they did the same thing, but they also tested shelf life of meat and they found out that these steers had a better shelf life as well overall. Now I wanna go into new research or questions. Pretty much uh, what I mean by this is just that uh, based on what we know in the industry right now and the research that is available, this is stuff that I have questions about and hope that we come up with answers soon. And the way that I want these answers to happen, I would just like to have research done. I don't know if that's the answer is extension or not, but the, as you can see, most of the research is done on that cold seaweed. and Blending cytokine and auxin dominant products is a new thing, but uh, we're all hesitant to kind of try it just because uh, we don't know that there's no evidence. Uh, I mean, there's trials, but you can't totally trust that. And I'm seeing it used a lot in crops now. Like I'm starting to see it pick up. It's not a lot, but people are using it. And I'd like to see how this affects animals as well, because I don't think um, to the best of my knowledge, that question has been proposed. And I'd like to see if it does anything with their immunity system, if it helps them or hurts them. Uh, and the only way to find out is to try it. Now I'm going to go over the benefits for using the, the seaweed fertilizer for forage and grazing. So I think uh, in agriculture, we're always being pressured to do more with less. That's just how it is. Um, we're always being pressured to make more yield with less inputs and using the seaweed fertilizer is gonna lead to a bigger root system, a bigger forage, and that's gonna be more food for the cattle. And I also believe it can help reduce fertilizer bills. And you're helping the forage and the animals grazing on it in one shot. So that is the benefit. Now I gotta talk about some negatives and drawbacks. This is still an added cost to your program, especially with application, and it will take up room in your tank mix with your normal program. The biggest problem is that there's little to no regulation. So there's a confusion on the percentages on the label and you have to do your own homework. Um, and I've seen it labeled as a soil amendment, foliar and a PGR, and that's loads of problems, especially in a state like California that's got high regulation because it's registered, the Acadian product um, is registered as a PGR. Um, it's one of their products, I forgot the name of it, but um, they can't use it for forages because it's labeled as a PGR. So that's a drawback. I do wanna talk money. So uh, Tasco is 75 cents a month per head. Acadian, 30 gallons, 30 bucks a gallon. Africa, that's the middle of the road. $15 a gallon, and then there's Fertum, $50 a gallon. And I do wanna make a disclaimer here that these numbers are FOB and rounded estimates based on data that was collected in 2020. So do not quote me, but this is a question I get all the time from uh, my customers as an agronomist is how much is this gonna cost me? Should we use this product in forages today? That was my original question when starting this project. And my answer is yes. I do have a word of caution. There's no silver bullets and there's more research to be done. There needs to be a customizable approach. So you need to be asking yourself, why am I using this product? Is it for stress relief? Is it to help with a foliar issue? That has to be answered before you go out looking for products. And there just needs to be education. Uh, I, 
in my undergraduate and graduate career, I haven't once heard a professor talk about using seaweed. And uh, yeah, I think uh, education needs to be done. It needs to be talked about more. As a certified crop advisor, I haven't really had a class or a course where it taught me anything about seaweeds. So um, I think that needs to be improved. But most importantly, uh, I encourage my customers and anybody that's considering using a seaweed product to do your own education. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Here are all my citations.